Let us bow our heads now. With our heads bowed and our hearts bowed before God, the closing of this great convention, jubilee that we've had here and around the word of the Lord, I wonder tonight if our hearts isn't just bursting for something from God. If it is, let's just raise up our hands to Him and say, and say this is my request, Lord, you know. A heavenly Father, look down now upon our hands. Them hands up means that we surrender our all to you. You know what we have need of, Father, and we pray that you will supply our needs. Sometimes our wants are more than our needs, but Father, you supply our needs because we can ask that with faith. You promised you'd do it. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Brother Moore and Sister Moore, Brother Brown and his, Brother Lyle, Brother Boulair and all of these fine people here, the church, the trustees, deacons, whatever they may be, uh, certainly um, thankful for this opportunity and fine time that I've had being here. These great founders that come in here years ago with pieces of paper in the bottom of their shoe and has given an unselfish, dedicated effort to bring forth this uh, worship place here and these people. I think Shreveport is greatly indebted to man like Jack Moore and these people like this. Here. And with untiring and unselfish effort, they have tried to establish a place where the light of God and the life of God can go to the people who are wayfaring men and women who will drop in and enjoy the services. May it long stand to the coming of the Lord Jesus until he's finished with it. And I have greatly enjoyed the congregations, your fine respond to the the ministry, to the messages, and the great things that God has done for us. It's just unlimited, and we'll never know what it's meant until we cross the other side, because seed has been planted that will come to life in the days ahead of us. And many has been healed probably at this moment, knows nothing about it. After a while, you find out it's gone. And we find that so much. It isn't just what you see happen. You don't ever know what's going to happen, what will happen as a result of it. And I trust that there, there will not be any feeble people that uh, will leave this meeting with what they have the sufficient faith to know that the work is done and will be well. For those who raise their hands to Christ for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and many uh, things in the the works of grace that you desired God to work on with you, I just trust that every one of you be filled with the Holy Ghost, everyone. Don't forget my message on the token. You must stay with that. Remember, display the token. Now, we have to leave immediately for Arizona and Yuma and uh, Phoenix. And then we'll be back through the south here i just don't know the itinerary just what it is but we'll be here i think it's in lower louisiana again along about february somewhere here in louisiana uh, dallas and on into over in georgia uh, and that over in there and into florida and then we're supposed to go to europe from there until june and then we come back here through uh, uh, july and to the middle of august and then go back way down under the earth in south america uh, uh, not South America, South Africa. And on the second day of September, uh, this coming 1964, the Lord willing, we begin in, in Durban, South Africa, where we saw 30,000 uh, people uh, come to the Lord at one time. Brother Julius Statscliffe, sitting here, was at the meeting at that time. I think that is right. And I guess Brother Julius has been introduced, the man who wrote the book of uh, Prophet Visit South Africa. I uh, Sister Stadcliffe, no doubt, is here somewhere. I, I can't place her. Just said, yeah, yes, now I do. And uh, um, the children. I remember a few years ago, Minneapolis, they were little bitty fellows. Now I have to look up to them. <laughs> Great big boy and girl. <clears throat> it was Sister Stadcliffe here not long ago that really had my heart whirling around. A little mother. She lost her baby. And the Lord was seen fit to take it away and 
she'd call me and she wanted to go to fly me over to Germany. And the doctor was so kind to wait and let the baby lay there. The little fellow died suddenly, a sweet little plumpy girl. And Sister Stas Clifford lost her mother and she pretty well broke up. This baby certainly had got the best of her and she got on the phone long distance from Germany and wanted to fly over and I said, Sister Stanscliffe, she confessed her faith that she believed that the Lord Jesus had sent me for the work in the last days and it's a loyal testimony that no one could give and she meant it with all of her heart. She'd seen the Lord God do such things as that, raise up the dead after they were dead. But you see, you really... As much as I, how what a glory that would have been to God in Germany and everything. If I could have done it myself, I would have done it. But the first thing, we mustn't go until we know what we're going for. So I went out and prayed, and I think she stayed on the phone part of the time through the night. And the next day I come in, there was nothing. Again, Meadie said, my wife said, Sister Saskia called twice. Any word from the Lord yet? I said, not a thing. And I said, well, I went out and prayed again. It's in the woods that night. Then, of course, the little baby had to be taken care of. And then just as I was coming in, the Lord Jesus, a vision struck, standing from me, and I heard his voice say, Don't rebuke that. That's the hand of the Lord. So I knew then that God, for some reason, had taken her baby to glory, and it was a, certainly against the will of the Lord for me to say anything contrary to it. And then... I thought, well, that would be a big letdown. But the one thing I did, I minded the Lord. I did what he told me. You know, not long ago, I got a letter from a minister over there. And he had made a statement by some more ministers. He said, the one, and he was, I think he might have been a German Lutheran. I'm not sure. But he said, there's one thing that I can admire about Brother Branham. When all the excitement is going on, he stayed steady till he got a clear-cut decision from God. Then he knew what he was doing. That's the only way you can do those things is first hear from the Lord. When he tells, if he told me tonight that to go up there and raise out of that cemetery President Kennedy, I'd invite the whole world to come watch it done. For I'd have, thus saith the Lord. Now, but how can I say, thus saith the Lord, until the Lord has said, thus? Many times people get all excited and go under impressions and things like that and what their best of their mental can think. That ain't always true. Wait till he tells you and you know it. Then you've got it exactly. You don't have to guess about it. He's done told you. It's thus saith the Lord. Then he's told you and then you can go say what he said. Until then, you can go and do everything you can, do what you can yourself. But you can't be sure until God has said so. Then you're positive. On the tape, of what time is it, sirs? Many of you has got the tape. See? I could speak for the chapters and anywhere else and say, It's thus saith the Lord. I'll meet seven angels and it'll be known the country's over. See? And something's fixing to happen. For he told me, there it was. Just three months afterwards. See? And all these other things. When, you, when you, the Lord has spoken, it's got to happen. That's the reason... That I know that His Word is perfect. No matter what people think about it, it's the Word of God. That's right. That's thus saith the Lord. Right? That's, and we know that that's true. Jesus is coming. When, I don't know. What form, how you come, I have an idea, but I, I don't know. It's wrote in here, He said, I, If I be taken up, you draw a man to Him, and He would come again. I know he's coming. Oh, I, I, that's positive. And it doesn't matter to me when it is. See, if it's tonight, or if it's next year, or if it's a thousand years from now, just so he comes, I got eternal life. I ain't going to be any older. I'm just going to be there when he comes. That's all. That's the, see, it doesn't matter to me when, how, which way he does it, just so I'm there. And he promised me that I would be there, and he has already given me eternal life. Because he said, he that can receive my words and believe on him that sent me has eternal life and shall not come to the judgment, but pass from death to life. That's good enough for me. Right there, I, that's my absolute. <laughs> that's my absolute. He promised it. There's no way for it to ever fail. It just cannot fail. No more than God can fail. It's impossible for God to fail. 
That's one thing that God cannot do. Fail. <laughs> you can't fail. Aren't you happy for that? Oh, my. When I begin to see the years counting up and, and begin to see uh, two or three services a day begin to make me get just a little bit tired. <laughs> Where it used to didn't bother me. But then I think, well, what difference does it make? I want to ask you something. We're just home folks, so... On that, what if you're 80 years old tonight or you're 15 years old tonight? If you're 80 years old and you live till this time tomorrow night, you'll outlive many, many young 16-year-old children. You ever think of that? You sure will. You're here for a purpose, to serve God. So what difference is the age it is to you? You serve God. If God come to me and said, I want you to go to earth, and, uh, and I was up there, and he said, go to earth, I'm going to give you a, a hundred years space of the knowledge, but I want you to lot your, your years. What years you want to take? The first 25, the second 25, the third 25, or the last uh, 25? What would I say? Well, if I'm going to put my time here to be a, oh, uh, a football player or an athlete or something, I better take the first 25. If I'm going to be here to be a carpenter or some uh, person like that, well, I better take the second 25. Right. But if I want to take to serve the Lord, I'll take the last 25 Amen. from 75 to 100 because I've had the accumulation of that much knowledge. I know more about it. Yeah. As long as I can stand on my two feet and walk around, what difference does it make how old I am? I'm here to serve the Lord, and that's it. Amen. Amen. That's good enough for me. He promised it. <laughs> now, I want to thank each and every one of you for your kindness and uh, trusting that the Lord willing it, that uh, again we'll meet somewhere in this earth. If not no more here, we will on the other side. And the Lord bless. And I want to pray over these handkerchiefs as soon as we get into the message. We don't know just exactly what will happen. We tried to put... A couple nights in the three, about three nights of the five or six, five nights of Lee, the Lord gave us a calling among the people of uh, calling the people out where the Lord would heal them. And then we had a, one night, last night, we brought every person that wanted to be prayed right through the prayer line and prayed for them. And I have hope that I haven't failed anywhere to try to do everything that I know how to do uh, for us to be in better spiritual condition and physical condition tonight than we were when we come in here about four or five nights ago. If I fail, God forgive me and you forgive me. Now for the closing message, and I'm going to try to make it just quick as possible because I, uh, I preach long and I, I've told my congregation and so forth that beginning of the first year, I'm going to try to I've tried it for the last 35 years, and it's been a ministry to cut down from this two hours and so forth down to 30 minutes. <laughs> but uh, I'm so slow, I can't say what I want to say in 30 minutes. Or anything. Uh, I'm a southerner, you know, and so I, I just have to, I can't think of it too fast. I just got to wait and see, I got to wait on him for my words. <laughs> so I, and I, I just as long as I can wait on him and you just be patient with me. Now, let's read some scripture so we know that this won't pass away. And after we're having our little uh, get-together of friendship and talking, before we approach this real sacred part of the service, bringing the bread of life, let's just pray again. Lord Jesus, now we are grateful to you. We're all turning to you to thank you for this great days and nights of service, fellowship around the Word and with the people. We're grateful, Lord. Our spirits has been lifted up, and we're so thankful that we've been able to sit in heavenly places with you. And now, Father, on this great and last night of the, the love feast, may you stand in the midst of us again tonight and cry, He that's thirsty, come unto me. Grant it, Lord. We know you will because you do it. That's your way of doing things, and you never change it. And I pray, God, that you'll break the bread of life to us. May we be able to receive that word into our heart that will open a fountain of blessings to all of us. Bless the reading of the word, and help me as I try to break the bread of life 
to the congregation for whatever the need is. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Let's turn to the, uh, the book of the Judges, uh, the Judges of Israel. And I want to turn to the 16th chapter of Judges to read uh, a portion of the, of the Word. Judges, the 16th chapter, and I want to read the 27th and the 28th verses. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines, Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women. Beheld, beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee. And strengthen me, I pray thee. Only this once, O Lord, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. What a pitiful sight. And this little subject, I'm going to take a text out of it calling, Just Once More, Lord. Just Once More. Must have been a hot day. It had a great celebration. And it makes me feel bad every time I think of it, because the nature of that religious celebration. Uh, you know, a celebration's all right, but it's according to the nature of the celebration. And this was one celebration that I certainly hate to refer to. It was in the land of the Philistines. And they were celebrating, it just makes me feel bad to say it, victory over God's servants. God's disobedient servant had brought a reproach upon the name of the Lord and went down in defeat. And these Philistines were uh, celebrating the, the great time of victory that their fish god had gotten victory over Jehovah's servant. If that isn't a text to end up a meeting on. But I felt led as I was looking through some five or six hundred texts that I had there. My eyes dropped upon this text here and I thought, I believe I'll just uh, talk about that a little while tonight. And maybe that's what the Holy Spirit would want us to know something about in here. Uh, about hot day, I believe, and the sacrifices was burning and the fire around this great fish god. And there were 3,000 Philistines looking down at the pair as they entered the great stadium. It must have been like a mushroom, the way they fixed it. Uh, like, a, I'd say, something on the order of a of a mushroom or toadstool turned up like this with two great uh, pilasters or, or pillows holding up the stadium as it's set like a more on this shape maybe so that the people in this great stadium could look down to the entertainment that was going on down on the main floor. And highly polished warlords attended that meeting. And their fine jeweled ladies was at the meeting. And they all stopped suddenly to lean forward. The main event was just about to take place. We have uh, sometimes what we call the preliminaries. They, and then the introduction, the prelude to the, uh, the main event. And they'd had much entertainment as they did sometimes sacrificing and killing and so forth. But now, the, the main event was just about to take place and all this bunch of fine celebrity of all the, uh, the regions in the Philistine land, they raised up because they were a, a privilege. They were setting up in this big, uh, we call it like a mushroom. And perhaps the poor and so forth were down here on the on the floor, but they set up where they could get a good look and see all the entertainment. It was a, it was a celebrity box. 
Three thousand of them. The air was stinking with drinks. Drunken reverie all day, drinking and slobbering and carrying on. The way a drunken brawl can be like that. And they all stood up because the main vent event was about to take place and they leaned over. They wanted to get a good look. They couldn't afford to miss this. Well, this is the main event. What did they see? A little boy leading a blind man out to the middle of the floor in the celebration of the fish god Dagon. The lad led this stumbling, blind book of flesh, blind and to the post, and stood him by the side of the post to make sport. So this is Samson, a man that was a, an outstanding servant of God. Now he stands there humiliated, blind, weakened, a disgrace. It's a picture of a, of a demoralized, sunken generation. It's a picture of of a, of a nation that has lost its hope with God. It's a picture of a church that's lost its hold on God's Word. Because that's what Samson represented here. Humiliated, broken. He was in a terrible condition as he sat there, or stood there, rather. So... Could you imagine him standing, this great man, that one time what he could do, and here he is standing here in that condition. Humiliated, as I said, broken. A symbol, and I want to uh, declare tonight this symbol represents the very hour that we're now living. The condition of the church now. Broken, out of the word of the Lord, humiliated, out of its place and the question is coming today the handwriting's on the wall and who can read it they know nothing about it let's take and search the minds of those Philistines this man's very name Samson at one time caused the whole nation to tremble just mention Samson because God was with him. And the nations tremble because of his very name. That's the same way it used to be the name of Jesus Christ. But now it, it's used as a curse word. Jokes. There don't seem to be any more reverence to it. When that name is above every name that was ever named on mortal tongues. It's a name that even it's a high exalted above every name that's in heaven. Every name upon the earth. And all the family in heaven and in earth is named it. And yet man take it in curse words. Church members use it in jokes. And many religious leaders blaspheme it with their creeds. That's the reason that we're humiliated in the face of communism, Romanism, and Protestantism, and the things that's rising in the earth today. And that's the reason that we're humiliated. We ought to know these answers. God's got it in His book for this day. But we have went to something else. Forgot about it. Many of these Philistines, as they stood there, of them great warriors, no doubt, somebody announced that the next event is Samson. Many of those warriors with their fine, jeweled, and polished up uh, women looked over the banisher and remembered seeing Samson stand in a different way one time. When the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. 
standing with the jawbone of a mule in his hands, with a thousand Philistines laying around him, and they'd run to a rock somewhere to take refuge. When a man picked up the jawbone of a mule that had been laying on the desert, anyone knows that one hit on a rock or anything with that bone would shatter it to pieces. And those helmets, some of them was an inch to an inch and a half thick of brass. And this man was not a soldier. And he wasn't a trained man for, for the spear. And Philistines with a coat of nail, nail that is laced over, lap over like a jealousy window with a metal that keeps spears and things from hitting them. And also with helmets and with shields and with spears. And they surrounded this man, Samson, and thought the great uh, cream of the army would be able to take this man. And he had nothing in his hand. He found an old dry jawbone of the mule. And he began to hit right and left until he beat down a thousand Philistines. Why? The Bible said the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. Here he stood different now. He'd give away his secret. And they plainly couldn't remember him. There might have been another group up there could remember one night. And when Delilah had bewitched him into the, uh, the city of, of Gaza, and they closed their big gates, probably weighing a ton or more apiece, great big brass gates to the city, it had iron bars and it went back into the rocks and fast with such hinges that we wouldn't have such like it today. And they said the Philistines be up on these Samson. And man, the soldiers standing around the gate and was speechless when he could break the cards, walk down, and they scattered like a bunch of roaches at night time when the lights turned on. The Spirit of the Lord up on him, reached over, jerked one gate out, jerked the other out, and put it on his shoulder, and walked up the hill and sat down. They could remember that. What a warrior. Many of them could remember that. A seeming and great victory. But look at him now. That's a picture of the church. I can read in the Bible of the church when it was first filled with the Holy Ghost. Great signs and wonders accompanied their meetings. We can remember a few years ago, 40 or 50 years ago, when the church was filled with that same power. But look at it today. She stands stripped. Something has stripped her. The same thing that stripped Samson. All caused by listening to a woman. A tuck him in. And what stripped the church is listening to that organized woman situation, that old Jezebel. The very thing that Samson had been raised up to defeat had defeated him. And the Pentecostal church tonight stands in those same tracks. The very thing she was raised up to defeat denominationalism, she has grouped herself back into it again, and her power's gone. Right? The power of the Lord left her. We ought to know that every time through history... That a church ever organized, God left it right then. It fell and never did rise again. And Pentecost was something that come out of the denomination. But what it was, we adopted man-made leadership instead of the Holy Ghost. That's exactly what Samson done. Think of it. What a must have went through that man's mind while he stood there. He must have thought of all the great victories God had given him. 
the great things that God had done with him and for him. And and how that while he was with God, the power of his spirit and the joy and the peace that he had while he was with God. And of God and his people, how Samson had failed him. Now, the very nation that Samson was raised up to destroy had him bound. And the very thing that God raised Pentecost to do has him bound. Stripped of fellowship, stripped of power, fussing, stewing, lukewarm members. Fine things, great. Everything, they, they'd be better off if they, if they had the old Salvation Army drum or the little old guitar down on the corner somewhere again. I'd rather have it like that and have our cathedrals that we're getting costing millions of dollars. But there he stood. He had failed. I was a prisoner of the very nation that God raised him up to destroy They had him doing tricks to entertain them. That's all it is today. Some kind of a little gimmick to try to entertain them. Let a woman lure him from the promised Word of God. That's the same thing the church did as let a woman, Jezebel, the mother of harlots, represented in Revelation 17, lure them right back into the vomit that they come out of. As the Bible says, as a hog go returns to its waller and a dog to its vomit, and as long as that hog remains a hog, he his nature is a hog, He'll go right back to the water. And you know, the only way you'll keep him out of the mud hole is to change his nature. That's the only way you're going to ever get any difference in the church today. It's got to have a change of nature. And instead of some ecclesiastical system leading the preachers around, it'll take the Holy Ghost to the Word to lead them back to that god fearing spirit again right if the dog vomit and it made him sick at his stomach the first time won't it make him sick again and if God called us out of such a mess because it, why would it do the same thing again then we go right back into it the same thing it should never be done this Jezebel system now blind spiritually I'm saying to the word of God Joining themselves right into the council of churches. Everything, our great evangelical teaching, we had to forfeit that to be an organization because all organizations that isn't in this council of churches, I got the paper on it, that even if your church is not in this council of churches, in time of trouble, they can use your church to store emanation or anything they want to. And if any man is caught Having a prayer for anybody outside of uh, affiliating with this council of churches can be shot as a federal offense. That's right. I got the papers on it from Washington. You're, they're going to force you into it. That's why I've been against this organizational system. That's it. I had to keep it quiet about being the mark of the beast, but it's late enough now that you can know it's the truth. Mm-hmm. Okay. It is. It's exactly that. Now, what has it done? It's brought the church stripped of its power. Nothing but name. It pictures it exactly in Revelation 3. The Lady Osea Church Age rejected Christ and on the outside. Exactly. Why? It did just exactly like its mother did. Went back to the denominational. Pentecost born out of denominational. Born out of that, and as soon as they got a bunch of kids come in, 
from some school and they had to have seminaries and things to, instead of upper rooms. And now many of the big churches, a man has to pass a psychiatrist test before he's permitted to be an overseas missionary. The first church didn't have to test the psychiatrist test, but they had to go through the test of the blood of Jesus Christ. What well, made the difference? Notice, Samson give away his secret to Delilah. She finally loved him and patted him and told him he was a nice man. How she loved him until she found where the secret was. Then she bobbed off the secret. That's exactly the way old Mother Jezebel has done the Protestant church, has cropped in, and now they're compromising on a few little doctrines they said to have so they can have unity over the world. And the first place the church got her locks bobbed off was at Nicaea, and she's going to bob them again since she's been here. That's her secret is the Word. If you abide in me and my Word and you can ask what you will, it'll be done for you. Okay? That's where they lose their secret. Now look at them. Defeated just like Samson was. Ministers, instead of being born, as David Duplicis said one time, God don't have Pentecostal grandchildren. But that's the way you say my mother was Pentecostal. She had an experience. She did this. My father did so and so. That ain't got nothing to do with you. You've got to have the same thing. Amen. Now, we got seminaries that hatch out our ministers, and we're building bigger ones all the time. And, um, and we got students of psychology. And that's all right if you want to teach psychology. I don't care about psychology. I just want to know Jesus Christ. That's all I... I, I, all I want to know is Him. Yes. Now we find that we got it. It certainly has to bring to pass the prophecy of 2 Timothy 3, where they be lukewarm, you know, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than of God, and truce breakers, incontinent, and, and fierce and despisers of those that are good. What has it done to us? It's almost made our Pentecostal women a uh, Hollywood showmanship. <laughs> right it used to be wrong to go to the movies the bicycle but now you know the devil just beat him to that he put it right in the house that's right it used to be wrong to do it, it used to be wrong for our sisters to cut the hair wear short dresses but now it isn't not in the Pentecostal way of thinking in their organization, but it's still wrong by God's Word. Amen. But you see, they got their, 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 their power bobbed off. Yeah. And then they say, well, our church believes. I don't care what your church believes. It's what God said. Amen. That's the reason she stands today without the answer. That's exactly the way Samson stood. Samson was the same thing. He must have thought of his eras as he stood there. I don't believe a man could stand there and think sensibly. But what could think, knowing here he is, now he's just become a, a, a stumbling block. What a condition. Great big man stand there. All the man that ever was in him, as far as what I call muscles, every one of them was there. He still had his muscles. He still had his big muscles. His biceps he had. He had great big fists. He still probably was just as big as he ever was. Frankly, the Pentecostal church is a lot bigger than it ever was. <laughs> but where was God? That's it. Yes. And as he stood there remembering his era, he remembered what caused it first. What caused it first was not exactly his natural eyes put out, but it was his spiritual sight put out. That he let Delilah woo him into it. And that's what's hindered the church today is the spiritual insight of the Word of God has been swapped for a bunch of creeds. That's the eye. 
The devil is, first thing he can do is put your eyes out. Tell you it's a bunch of holy rollers. Tell you it's this, that, or the other. Or some devil's move. Or it's a mental telepathy. Or something on that order. If he can punch your eyes out, you're in darkness. Notice Samson's first plea in his prayer. Lord, that I might avenge my two eyes. He knew there's where his trouble come. Notice his locks had grown out. But he was blind. He'd have to stagger all the rest of his days. He was blind. We may have as big a machinery as we ever had and as many members. But what good does it do if you're blind to the very thing that's going on in front of you and you can't see it? What's happening right here day by day along with the people of the Holy Spirit revealing Himself? And people don't see it. That's blind. Spiritual blind. They stood and watched Jesus perform miracles and so forth and declare Himself to be the Messiah. And they couldn't see it. He said they got eyes, but they can't see. They were blind, and Samson was blind. But here's what Samson recognized that the church has never come to yet. He knew there was a possibility of coming back again. If the church could only know that, a possibility. But the people of the day don't seem to catch the vision yet. They don't seem to catch it that there is a possibility. It doesn't come through, you shout a little more, pat your hands a little more, or dance a little more. That isn't it. No, it's back to the Word. There's a possibility of coming back and getting the Word on the inside again. You bypassed it there. Notice, they sit tight. Oh, sure. Clap their hands. Yes, sir. But you see, that's all sails without any anchor. I've seen the heathens clap their hands, do a dance, speak in tongues, and do all those things and interpret it. But they were African heathens. Sure. I've seen them lay a pencil down. And that witch doctor stood there and made that pencil stand up and it run up and down on a place up there and come back and played like shaving a haircut, two bits. And drawed out an unknown tongue. And wrote it out. And one of them stood there interpreting it. Oh, my. You can't rely on that. Many of them speak in tongues and they deny the very principles of Jesus Christ. I've took my Bible, laid it right out to a man who's standing there speaking in tongues. I say, brother, this is exactly, I don't even want to see it. Glory to God. I know what Jesus said. I don't care about the rest of it. Hallelujah. Glory to God like that. Well, a man that would turn his back upon truth and actually uh, put on a shindig like that to keep from seeing the truth, that's hypocrisy. And the heights of it. Just because he'd have to give up his fellowship card if he accepted what was truth. That's worse than Samson. Notice. But they didn't catch it. They sat tight. Now, oh, sure, we have great getting-togethers, meetings, we call it, worldly uh, revivals and so forth, all full of tinsel. <laughs> sure, great big things and great advertisement. A man with the message of the hour and so and so and so and so. We have all of that, but where's God? Uh, that's the thing we're looking for. Where's God? A great big piece of scholarly showmanship, somebody with enough education that wouldn't uh, use the word uh, half the people couldn't understand what he was saying. And yet he's got an honorary degree and a degree and a degree and a degree. And he can lectionary and put the words together and stand so perfectly straight and say, Ah, oh, man, just exactly right. And turn like a military man, walk off the platform. But where is God? Samson had stood in that place one time himself and know the power of God, but now he had been shaven of those privileges. He was just as big as he ever was, but God wasn't there. We got a lot of that today. It's too bad that we have it, but we have it. Now we notice. But it don't bring back the Spirit of God. 
Now, the thing of it is, the people are not willing to pay the price to get back to that. I believe that God just remains the same as He ever was. But the thing of it is, the people has got so wound up into the world and the world in them, till they just got just enough religion to make them miserable. Not enough to really turn loose to God and give your whole heart into Him. But enough... Now, I'll go to church, certainly. I enjoy good singing, clapping hands. Yeah, I love that, see. But when it comes right down to putting what you say you believe into practice, and willing to confess the wrong, they don't do it. It just isn't there. They don't have it. Well, that's real conviction. That's what we need. We've long left that a long time ago and swapped it. Prayer and, and confession and conviction, we swapped it for emotion. A shaking or a jerking or a jumping up and down. That's the reason there's no holding tight because there's nothing there to hold them. Until you come up on the basis of God's word of godly sorrow. Ready to repent and make anything right and do what's right. Ready to live right. I don't care what the people say or anything else. You live for, your, for Jesus Christ and what he said. Then you take a church like that coming back. There's a possibility of it coming. But they're not willing to do it. Samson prayed like right. Lord, let me die with these Philistines. Oh, my. See what it's going to cost him? What if God answers his prayer? Let me die. Oh, I like that. Was it Patrick Henry said, give me liberty, give me death? That's right. All right. That's it. Liberty or death. It's back to God or, or death. What are we going to do? What are we mimicking? What are we trying to play Christianity? If the Holy Ghost is still the Holy Ghost that fell at Pentecost, it still does the same things it did then, the same power, the same Spirit, it'll work the same way. We don't need a council of churches. We need the Bible back in action. Exactly. Now we find out that Samson prayed right. Lord, let me die with the enemy. Die to the enemy that had got him in that way. If there's anything that people ought to pray for tonight, and we see the thing that's done this, is getting away from the Bible to a creed. Then die with the thing. Get out of it. Die to it. Samson was willing to pay the price to get the power of God back again. There's a price to be paid for. But uh, today the people don't seem to... Oh, we hear revival, sure. Yes, we have a denominational revival. Get more members in and things like that. But look at the morals. It's constantly decaying. Look how further and further away from God they're getting all the time. Getting away from the Word. And now when they go in and come into the council of churches... Well, they've accepted the biggest killer that the church word has got. The word that God left to them. They bypass all of that. You can't teach that Bible. You've got to teach their creed. There it is. Samson knew one thing, and I wonder if the church realizes today. He knew that his backslidden condition couldn't meet the challenge of the hour. And I know today that the backslidden condition of the church can't meet the challenge of this hour. And it's going to be worse. The Bible said, as Jambus and Jambus withstood Moses, so will they, men of reprobate mind, concerning the faith. They can almost impersonate it exactly. Moses went out with a, his com a command from God with a stick in his hand. And God said, do this sign before them. And if they won't listen to that, then do this sign before them. And if you won't listen to that, then I'll be with you. I'll take care of the rest of it. Well, Moses went down with his first sign. And as soon as he performed his first sign, there's impersonators everywhere doing the same thing. But Moses never fussed about it. He just stood still. For he knew that it was God that sent him. 
We're going to have that repeat again in the last days, remember. And our backslidden state now will not meet the challenge of the hour. Yet all the big frames here. There's more Pentecostals in the world today than there ever was, if we know of. More Pentecostal believers. That's right. You know, uh, the Sunday Visitor, the Catholic paper, Sunday paper called the Sunday Visitor, I believe about two years ago, made some kind of a statement like this. He said, the fastest growing church in the world is the Pentecostals. said, last year the Catholic Church uh, recorded a million conversions to Catholicism. But said, the, that's all Catholicism. But said, the Pentecostal church alone in itself recorded 1,500,000. Now, the frame is there, but we don't have the power we had when we were a handful. All of Samson's big books stood there, but where was the power of the Lord? Yes, the denominational system don't vindicate the word of the Lord. That's right. Now notice, I was talking to a priest that lives out the lane from me, the Sacred Heart Church. About a month ago, since this new issue's come on, the Lutheran preacher had the priest of the Catholic Church, Sacred Heart Church, up to preach in his pulpit for him. And the, the Catholic uh, priest had the Lutheran minister down to say Mass for him. Swapping pulpit, big piece of paper. Huh? Sure. Oh, my. If anybody could see that. And not, if you can't understand that, well, you're, you're, you're certainly scripturally blind. <laughs> yes. I've talked to this priest. And he said to me, he said, uh, I want to talk to you, uh, Mr. Branham. I said, all right. And he said, did you baptize uh, this uh, Fraser girl by the name of Mary Elizabeth Fraser? I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, the bishop wants your signed statement about it. I said, I understand that is she a, a turned Catholic. He said, yes, that she'd come back to the mother church. And I said, yes, sir. I said, her mother was telling me about it. I said, yes, her mother didn't take it too well. I said, her mother told me she'd rather walk with her to the grave. And I said, frankly, that's what she's doing. And so he said, um, he said, I want you to sign this statement. He said, did you baptize her? Uh, how did you baptize her? I said, a Christian uh, baptism. And he said, I mean, how, sir? Did you uh, sprinkle her, pour, or immerse her? I said, Christian baptism is immersing. Uh-huh. So, all right. So, now, you, a, you immersed her then in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I said, yes, sir, that's Jesus Christ. That's the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's the way I, I baptized her. And uh, he said, you baptized her in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I said, yes, sir. I never call them words now. I baptized her in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, which is Jesus Christ. He said, yes, sir, I see. And he put it down like that. He said, uh, you know, that's the way uh, uh, the early Catholic Church baptized him. I said, oh, is that right? And he said, yeah, that's the way. I said, what happened? He did run well. And he said, uh, well, he said, you see, he said, said, you believe a Bible. God is in his church. I said, God is in his word, sir. His word. I said, did you say Peter was the first pope? He said, he was. Well, I said, then, if the Catholic Church has to say all of its masses and, and Latin and so forth, where it won't change, then what did the first pope say in Acts 2.38 where he said, Repent and be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. He said, if you... I said, on this confession and so forth. I said, he said, well, didn't Jesus tell his disciples, Whosoever sins you remit to them, they're remitted? Whosoever sins you retain to them, they're retained. I said, he did. Then what's wrong with that? Your very Bible tells you that. I said, then if you'll remit sins the way that they remitted them, I'll go with you. So if Peter was asked, the one that had the keys, what must we do to be saved? He said, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Now you do it like that and I'll go with you. <laughs> Amen. That's the word. That's God's way of doing it. Weaken on him. That's, he said, well, uh, I, well, I never come to argue with you. I said, who was arguing? Uh-huh. I said, I never, I'm not arguing. I, you just asked me a question, and I answered it the best I know how. I said, I'm going to ask you one. I said, you said that the, 
that God was with the church. And I'm going to give you the benefit of telling you the first Christians, if you want to call them Catholic, all right. Peter, James, John, Mark, Luke, and all them. They Yes. I said then in following the order of the Bible that these apostles wrote. Now, you mean today that your diocese now is so much greater than it was then. You know more wisdom and you know how to take care of the... Yes, sir. That's exactly right. I said then why was it? That when they followed the commandments of Jesus Christ, they raised the dead, they cast out devils, they done all kinds of signs and wonders, and you don't do it today? Now what's wrong? If the church was better in the Lutheran age or the Wesleyan age or any other age than it was back there, why didn't they do the works of them then? Certainly. Back to the Word. Samson stood there stripped of his power. But you know, there was something I uh, want to hurry. The Philistines didn't notice while Samson is standing there thinking all this over. I wish I could take the Pentecostal world and back them up in a corner somewhere and let them think like that for a while. Just think these reasonable things. Where are we now with our great big book of organization? Everyone against the other one. The oneness against the twoness, the twoness against the threeness and so forth. All just that's the way it is. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. We should come back and come together and settle it up on the basis of thus saith the Lord. Amen. What's the matter with the prophets in the church? The word of the Lord is supposed to come to the prophets. And if a prophet that claims to be a prophet and will deny this truth in the Bible, according to the word, he's not a prophet. Amen. Now, we're supposed to have these gifts to set us in order. Keep us in order. But somehow or another we got away from it all. And they stand back in the corner. And here stood Samson, standing in the corner, thinking of all that had been. And these Philistines stand up there with their arms around these women, looking down, belching and drunk, and celebrating the victory over Jehovah. Servant. Oh, my. Don't that just send something through you to think of that? A victory over Jehovah's plan. Yes, standing there with a fish god. Dagon was a fish god. And there was burning sacrifice. Human lives were taken. A little child had to die for the sacrifice. Run a sword through it. His heart for the sacrifice. And there they were having this big celebration over the victory over Jehovah. And the church tonight, like a bunch of Philistines, is gloating over the idea that a council of churches after a while will shut out every church that don't belong to it. Samson, don't never bob your hair. Stay right with that word. I don't care what happens. You stay right there with that word. Don't get mixed up in that. Samson began to think, wonder if there's a possibility now, he said, I know my hairs go out, but I'm blind. There could be a possibility of another revival. There's a possibility. He said to the little boy, um, uh, put my hands up on the post. Is these the post that the whole building's fastened on? Yes. And you say all the kings and celebrities up on top. Yes. I'm tired uh, you've had to do, made me do so many tricks and things. Well, you just put my hands up on the post. And he put his hands up on the post and stood in between them, maybe like in this order. And he stood there with his hands against the post. The Philistines, celebrating and having such a big time, they forgot to watch him. Oh, my. But he began to think, God's still God. I know He is. I've tried Him. I've put Him to the test. I know He still remains God. It's me that's wrong. I'm the one that's sinned. They didn't notice the tears running out of that blinded sockets. Dripping down off of His chin. They didn't notice His lips moving. Lord, I've done wrong. Let me die with the Philistines. He wanted... God's Word manifested before that Jezebel more than he wanted his own life. Oh, if that desire could come to the church again. 
He wasn't praying for a new order, a new denomination, but that the Word of God might be made known again. The promise that he once had might come back to him again. He was aware of what would happen if his prayer was answered, but he was ready and in dead earnest. Oh, if the church could only get like that. Then he cried out. Slowly he was praying, It's possible, Lord. It is possible I stand here. All my big frames still together. I'm here, my hairs go out, but I couldn't see how to whoop them no more because my eyes is blind. I couldn't see where I was going. But it's possible that you let it happen again, Lord, to show your power. He screamed out once more, Lord. Just once more. Oh, if the church could only cry that. Once more, Lord, let us see your power. Once more. And as he cried and asked God, I can see them muscles begin to swell. Every fiber in his body began to twist. The Holy Ghost was coming up on him, man. He stretched forth his hands again with the power of the Holy Ghost up on him. Down went the building. The Bible said he killed more that day than he did all the rest of his days. He fulfilled the commission God gave him then. Once more, it's always been that way. When the power of God comes, the big structures of isms fall. Samson's greatest victory over his enemy was at his end time. Now let me say this just in closing. Pentecost, can we stand at the post of these big organizations? Can we stand at the post of Hollywood and all these other things that separate us from the love of God that's in Christ? And can we stand there and repent and cry aloud again, Lord, once more, make us Pentecost. Once more, Lord, once more, make us Pentecost. Once more, show your power into us, Lord. Just once more. Listen. Destroy your enemy before your enemy destroys you. He'll do it. Bring back the old-fashioned meetings and the thing. And, oh, leave Delilah alone. Leave the world alone. That thing, it woos you off into little things that you shouldn't. And little things, troubles come up in the church and you won't stand correction because you don't have to. You could drop off to another church and things like that. In the early days when a man didn't cope up with the Word of God, they packed him out dead. Bring us back to Pentecost. Not Hollywood showmanship, but a wholehearted turn to God is what we need. Once more, O oh Lord, once more. If I could see that happen, if my old weakening eyes could look again and see that church forget its differences, if I could see that denominational system break down their throat right into the lap of the council and say, we want nothing to do with it, we'll not far for our birthrights. If I could see the Trinity and oneness and all of them get together and say, Brethren, let's go back to where we left him off at. Let's go back to where we started fussing one another at. Right back up on the subject of water baptism and come right back and take the Bible away for it. And then cry once more, Lord, once more. And get all of this showmanship and a lot of these fellows up on the platform and knows more about God than a rabbit does about snowshoes. And these women with dresses so tight to their skins on the outside, walking up and down the platform, clapping their hands and jumping around like that, like a bunch of show or something or other. God, bring us back to the Holy Ghost and power in the manifestation of the Word. Once more, Lord. Once more. Do you believe it? Lord God, once more. Once more, let me see the presence of Jesus Christ walking through the church. Let me see His power and His promise made manifest before us. Once more, Lord, once more. God, be merciful. Help us. You see what these other things gets us? It kills a very... Uh, it drives away the nature of Christ out of the congregation, out of the, out of the church, out away from the people. We should be so woven together 
that there be nothing separate us from this word and our love for one another. Jesus Christ is here. He's our Father. He's our Mother. He's my Healer. He's my King. He's my God. He's my life. He's my joy. He's my peace. All that there is, He is for me. He's my all in all. He's here now. He wants to bring the church back to that place. Wonder if we could cry once more, Lord, and let the, the tears of repentance drop from our blinded sockets. I'm not exactly talking to this church. This is tape, you see here. This go around the world. Let our, let our people come back to that again. Let it come back to a place where we could call back a, a meeting like we used to have. Just even take 10 or 15 years back. Look how it's declined since then. Look how it's went down, down, down. It's got so it's almost a shame. A fellow feels embarrassed almost to talk about divine healing. You've been so much reproach brought up on it. Talk about the Holy Ghost when so much reproach has been brought up on it. That's right. It's not God's fault. It's a Samson that has left off of the principles of God's Word and has substituted something else and let the organization shave him down. Woo him into it. I say to you, my brother, sister, if I never see you no more, this side of the, of the great judgment bar of God, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. His word to me is life. He's here now. You believe that? Amen. I know He's here. And the only thing you have to do to know He's here is get yourself out of the way. As long as you're in the way then God cannot do nothing for you. When you think your thoughts, then God's thoughts don't have a chance. But if you'll quit thinking your thoughts and think His thoughts, my thoughts is not your thoughts, He said. If there be any praise, if there be any virtue, think on these things. Not what some church is going to say about it, but what God said about it. Like this little lady laying here shaking and this cop, that woman's going to lay like that all of her life. Unless she can get her, her faith set right straight on Jesus Christ. And no matter what comes or goes, it be revealed to her, then there's nothing going to stop the healing. Amen. That's right. But when you get your, it depends on what you're thinking about. If you'll just believe and have faith, God can do anything for you. And the greatest thing He can do for you tonight is sweep your soul right back into the presence of His being. Right back there to where every person in here. Just think, what if the Holy Ghost had everybody in here completely in His control? Think of what would take place tonight. Think what would take place in Shreveport by this time tomorrow night. They'd have headlines everywhere. A bunch of people went crazy. They were healing the sick and raising the dead and doing all kinds of things down in Shreveport, Louisiana, United States, USA. <laughs> They'd have it on television. Or what they was doing, if the Holy Ghost could take completely control, why don't He? He wants to. He's willing to. He's waiting. Well, you say, I've asked Him so many things. I just hate to ask Him too much. Ask the abundance that your joys might be full. Could you imagine a little fish a half inch long out in the middle of the Pacific saying, I better drink of this water sparingly. I might run out someday. <laughs> Could you think of a little mouse about that big in the great garners of Egypt think, I allowance myself to one grain a day because I might run out before the next harvest comes in. Oh, my. Now divide that by a hundred billion and that's how easy you can exhaust God's mercies and grace and power to you if you just believe it. You can just leave yourself out. I'm sorry. I, uh, that's, you can't exhaust Him. He's the inexhaustible fountain of eternal life. Here tonight to make manifested any divine promise of His Bible. Now, anybody that will believe it. Amen. Yes, sir. The only thing you do is drink. Come to the fountain and drink. Drink until you're satisfied. You can't exhaust him. No, sir. He is absolutely the inexhaustible. 
And you can just drink and drink and drink. You can drink your healing in. You can drink your salvation in. Just come and drink. Let him is thirsty. Come and drink. Amen. I, 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 I know he's here. And I know he'll do the exceedingly abundantly if we'll just let him do it. I just seen something happen. And I'm, I don't want to start one of them kind of services, you see. Of visions because uh, I, I'm talking about something else. <laughs> see, I'm talking about you coming, not for physical healing, but coming to, to as soon as I go to doing that. Now that's just, see, as soon as I want to relax myself then, to get away, the first thing you know, people call, you know, you feel like coming in. Here, I can tell you that man sitting in that car with his nephew's boy, that bad hip. If you believe, God will heal him and make him well. Do you believe that he'll heal him and make him well? If you do, well then, God will do it. Exactly right. Amen. Here's a man sitting right here looking right at me. He's praying for his family. He's really not from here. He's from South Carolina. Mr. Dixon. But if he'll just believe with all of his heart, God will grant that blessing to him. Do you believe it, sir? I'm a total stranger to him. I've never seen him in my life. Mm. 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 Amen. I've never seen him in my life. But you see what I mean? What is it? How does that work, Brother Branham, when Brother Branham can get out of the way? Yes, sir. When I can get out of the way, then Jesus Christ comes in. Just by the way, right over from him is another man caught fire, and he's from South Carolina, too. That's right. I see it hanging right over him. It's exactly right. He's praying for a brother that's an alcoholic. That's exactly right. Listen. Your... Brother Holmes, do you believe it? God, is that your name? God makes, God will grant it to you. Do you see what I mean? Once more, Lord. Once more. Let's stand up on our feet, everybody. Cry, Pentecostal. Raise up your hands. Once more, Lord. Once more, Lord. Once more. Hallelujah. I don't know what to do, but it's here. Let's cry with one accord. Once more, Lord. Cry out. Once more, Lord. Once more, Lord. Once more, Lord. Send your power. Send your blessings. Send the Holy Ghost upon us like a rushing mighty wind and fill every soul that's in here anew. Glory to God. Believe it with all your heart. Once more, Lord. Once more. Hallelujah. Drunk on the Spirit. If the Holy Ghost can just pour into you till you're so drunk you forget what your name is. You forget all your doubts. Get you so drunk on the Spirit till you forget your doubts. (laughs) Then you can get somewhere with God. And the cry once more goes up from the sincerity. Then you'll learn. Hallelujah. Fill with the Holy Ghost. He's drunk on the Spirit. God's righteousness and holiness and power get you so drunk to you forget who you are. You're nothing to begin with. Remember, God wants to come into you. Once more, Lord, once more. Once more, Lord, once more. Oh, Pentecostal, Pentecostal, run for your life. There's just a little time left. It's later than you think. If I never say another word from this pulpit, remember, run for your life. It's later than you think. I feel the Holy Spirit on me saying, say it again. Run for your life. It's later than you think. Once more, Lord. Once more. Fill life tabernacle with eternal life. Every member in here. And let the glory of the Lord fall upon this congregation, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe.
God. Once more, Lord, once more, let man forget who they are. Let man forget his unbelief. That we could cry once more, Lord, once more. Do you love him? Oh, God, Heavenly Father, give us a revival in our souls, Lord. We see the, the, the lamps are smoking. The fire on the altar is going out. Oh, Lord God, look down upon a sin-cursed nation. But, Lord, don't forget your people. People here have strived for years, Lord, to build this little economy for you. Life Tabernacle was built, Lord, for a soul-saving station, for revival. Oh, God, once more, pour your holy power into it. Surge every member. Take out every differences. Send down the array of God's holy fire and lighten our souls, Lord, with the presence of Jesus Christ. May the people not be so stooped in unbelief that they can see that you're here with us and you are the Word and a discerner of the thoughts of the heart as the Bible has been so proven to us over and over again. Lord God, let us wake to our senses of the Spirit of God being in our midst. Granted, Father, I commit it to you with myself. Amen. Brother, sister... I don't know in my Bible of any other thing God promised to do before the rapture of the church. I don't. You're thinking of a mark of the beast coming. I've told you it, they've done got it. See? The next thing left is for the rapture of the church. It could come at any time and not disrupt any scripture in the Bible as far as I know it. God knows that's true. Yes, sir. The time is at hand. It's later than we think. Let's just close our eyes and sing, I love Him. Maybe if we'll worship Him, praise Him, maybe He'll do something. I've prayed all this week to see a breaking forth in this tabernacle. I've prayed before I come here. i got people praying for this. Oh, there's, there's prayer going up for this. I'm trying to believe with all my heart. Let's wake up right quick. Let's just worship Him and praise Him as we sing it. Now, with our eyes closed and our hands to God... I love Him. I love Him because He first loved me and first trust my salvation. we sing the next verse shake hands with somebody by your Christian brother say God bless you now while we sing it I love ah if you love one another you can't keep from loving God because John oh, Now let's say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's say it again. Hallelujah. Again. Hallelujah. Praise our God. Ah.